Hey there, we've done a lot of uh, boundary value problems uh, recently, and the general approach that we've done is to approximate the derivatives, be it the second derivative, first derivative, or whatever, by some differencing formula, and you transform the differential equation into a series of coupled algebraic equations. And in general, when you do this, uh, the resulting matrices turn out to be sparse, which allows you to solve, in the case of linear systems, um, these sparse matrix, matrix equations to get a faster, uh, faster solution and uh, use less memory and all of that. And in this video I want to do take a, a, a different approach and it's going to amount to what is essentially a polynomial interpolation. The thing is instead of getting maybe a hundred by a hundred matrix we're going to get a I don't know six by six, eight by eight, something relatively small albeit a dense, a dense matrix that we have to, to invert to get this, the solution. Uh, you'll find a bunch of names for this technique in the literature. I'm just going to refer to it as orthogonal collocation, uh, just because that's the first uh, first name I've heard it referred to uh, referred to by. And this is why uh, we've done those videos on polynomial interpolations in kind of a computationally inefficient way, um, <clears throat> probably a year and a half ago at this point. Um, it's just basically as, as a uh, precursor to, to this video. This is something I've been meaning to do for some time. And normally when I do these videos, I do them all basically in one, uh, one day. Maybe I'll record the introduction or the outro uh, a se separate day, but usually it's one day. This, um, this video has been a couple months in the making, so I've just uh, been slammed with work and other things. So I actually started this video in April, so it's just been uh, on and off for a couple months. So if it seems disjointed or the audio quality changes, um, that's probably the reason why. So yeah, enough yammering, let's just get into it. Okay, so this technique is a basically a variation on polynomial interpolation. And just as a review, and we've done this in the past, uh, if you wanted to fit a polynomial to a given number of points, in this case, six, uh, you would uh, uh, you'd come up with a fifth order polynomial. So if you had n plus one points, you'd come up with an nth order polynomial and then for each xy pair you would basically you have a polynomial of that order so an example here if we have n plus one points this is how this would um, uh, this is the system of equations you would come up with and they are linear notice in these coefficients so that in matrix form you'd get something like this and the problem just boils down to finding the inverse of this matrix uh, here and there's a reason I did this uh, in matrix form, which is kind of computationally inefficient as opposed to, um, not Laplace, uh, Legend not Legendre, um, Lagrange interpol interpolating polynomials. Too many Frenchmen uh, with names starting with L, Lagrange. So we're going to apply the same technique to our boundary value problems where you have some sort of differential equation and we're going to assume second order. So you have a second derivative, first derivative, a uh, term just involving the function and then your uh, variable x and you're given two boundaries and we're going to assume this is on the domain 0 to 1. So at one boundary um, you can cast the boundary values in these this, this type of form here. So if you think about it like this you break your space down into some uh, number of grid points grid points and since it's a, this is a polynomial interpolation it's basically just a few num few a handful of grid points you know the boundary values you know the values here and here in this interior region you know that the differential equation basically written in this form is equal to zero so you have everything you need to know to basically do this polynomial interpolation so let's come down here and think about this for a moment so, if we write our polynomial like this, this is basically the same as above for polynomial interpolation here. Theta is our unknown coefficients here. And f, uh, which we don't know, uh, well, there are two things we don't know. We don't know these coefficients and we don't know the values of our f of x, except perhaps at the, the boundaries. So let's write this as uh, f is equal to some matrix a times our, our uh, column vector of theta and then theta obviously is equal to a inverse uh, times f so we have two unknowns here actually we don't know theta and we don't know f and obviously we do know the a matrix since we know our we our grid points so we can calculate th this easily enough now the first derivative of this polynomial is trivial to calculate here it's just this it's you don't take the first derivative and again the first derivative at any point on our grid here is going to lead to a system of equations here such as this 
and we can uh, cast it in terms of this equation here just by replacing our theta with um, with this here, our a inverse f. Uh, oops, there's a typo here. This should not be a theta. This should be an f, so let me uh, fix that. Okay, so I fixed that typo. Um, this should be a inverse f, so it's basically... Uh, just recasting it in terms of our unknown function values down here. And you can do the same thing for the second derivative. So obviously the second derivative of this polynomial is this, and in matrix form it's this, and we can kind of do the same same thing. So you have this matrix here, which we know. Uh, we know A inverse. We don't know F, but because we have the differential equation, we do know what the value of this vector is inside of all these internal uh, points here. And while we may not know it at the, the, the first and last points, we know the boundary conditions. So that's gonna, just going to change this first row of this matrix and the last row of this matrix. So that's it. So let's do this with a couple problems here. Uh, we've done this in the past here. Uh, these have exact solutions so we can check out check the validity of our results. So it's a simple simple differential equation here. At y is equal to 0, the function has a value of 3 y equals 1, or uh, x equals 1, I'm sorry, x equals 0, the function value is 3, x is equal to 1, the function value is 0, and the exact solution for comparison is this. Um, and we're going to do a second version here. The, this is the differential equation, this is the boundary values, so um, we're going to have to rescale this because this, this problem is on the domain uh, 0 to 2 pi but anyways this is um, the actual solution so um, yeah let me create a field up here to do my import so I'm gonna do that and one thing I did not mention uh, before I go on to actually coding up some stuff is how these grid points are chosen now in principle you can choose whatever grid points you want but in practice uh, what you end up doing is taking the roots of an orthogonal a polynomial that is orthogonal in this domain so zero to one so uh, for example if you had five internal grid points you would choose those points such that they are the roots of the an orthogonal polynomial of fifth order and um yeah so uh, let's do our import so we're going to need numpy so import numpy as np uh, we need to pull in the repmat command, so uh, to build kind of these repeated, uh, these matrices that have this kind of repeated format over and over, uh, we're going to need matplotlib, so import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Let's do our matplotlib inline. Um, and let's move on to actually solving this. So let me input a, input uh, a row underneath here. You know, I probably should have chosen a problem that had like some first derivative uh, boundary condition, but um, maybe I'll do a supplemental video on that at a later date because I'm sure there's going to be questions on that and um, we can uh, work through such a problem. So why don't we, for this problem, uh, I'll just make a note here. We're going to have... Um, a total of seven points on our grid. So two of those are the boundary conditions. So we're going to have five internal points. Um, and so we're going to need the roots of a fifth order Legendre polynomial. And we're going to have two points for the boundaries. So seven points in total. So uh, if I remember, I'm going to put a link to the video we did on the uh, NumPy's ability to use these special polynomials. So what we're going to do is take a Legendre polynomial, uh, rescale it to this interval 0 to 1, and find the roots uh, thereof. So let's create a variable called r, which is going to be the roots. So r is going to be equal to l dot roots. And let's just print out r to make sure everything is OK. And that looks good. So let me just get rid of this print statement. Uh, so these are the internal points, and let's tack on uh, for on this left-hand side a zero for you know the zero point, and a one at the end for our right-hand boundary. So there we go. I just use the insert and append command, and let's just print that out to make sure we're actually getting the right values. Looks good. So let's move on. 
So now we need to create what I called up here uh, the A matrix. Where is it? We need to create this matrix. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, so we need A, and then of course we need, for this we're going to need A inverse. So let's come down here. I'm just going to use the um, stack command with the axis set equal to 1 to build up this matrix. And now we need the inverse, and again that's easy, so A Let's call it a underscore inverse is equal to mp dot <clears throat> linear algebra dot inverse a. Does this run okay? Nope. Oh, uh, I did a. I need these to be capital R's. Okay, that's fixed. And now we need a matrix for the second derivative. We don't need the first deri derivative because it's not relevant to this problem. It's not in this equation, and the boundary conditions uh, don't. I don't use the first derivative. So we need to calculate this uh, matrix here. So what I think I'm going to do is do this in a stepwise uh, a manner. I'm going to create a, a matrix of these coefficients and then just basically multiply it through by the appropriate, uh, appropriate polynomial term. So I hope uh, this becomes obvious. Let me come down here and t is going to be equal to t. Uh, did I call it, I called it C, didn't I? C. Oh, long day. C is equal to, C is equal to this, and this is where we're using this repeated matrix command. So these are the coefficients, these are these numerical values here, 0, 0, 2, 6, and whatever. Um, uh, but, 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 but right now, yes, I do have the zeros in here. So let's print this out to make sure uh, we're doing this okay. So print C. Uh, again, it's a capital R. So there's our matrix of the coefficients, and now we just have to kind of multiply through the polynomial terms. So I'm going to do that by, uh, I'm going to do it by doing this here. So this is a, this represents our uh, second derivative. Remember, we have a sixth order, sixth order polynomial, so the second derivative is a fourth order polynomial. Uh, we need to pad it with two columns of zeros. Let me make sure this actually runs. Yes, it does. And now I'm just going to do an element-wise multiplication between what I called C and what I called temp. So C is going to be equal to C times temp. Looks good. And in our equation up here, what I actually called C uh, was not just, just this second derivative matrix, but this matrix multiplied times A inverse. So let's just add that in here. <clears throat> C is equal to C. This is matrix multiplication now times A inverse. Does this run? Yes, it does. So we now have our second derivative matrix here. Uh, we need a matrix here for this pi over 4 times y. So I'm going to call that matrix, I don't know, I'm, uh, I called uh, this B, I, I don't know what to call it. Um, uh, I'm just going to call it W, I guess. You know, when I upload this to GitHub, I think what I'm going to do actually is split like all these commands into, into separate cells and then in between them um, write out in kind of mathematical form here uh, what, what I'm doing uh, to construct these, these equations because um, this is getting, I think, just a bit confusing just kind of speaking through it. So our W matrix is going to be equal to what? It's going to be pi squared over 4. So that's np dot pi squared over 4. And that's going to be times the identity matrix. Times the identity matrix that has the same kind of uh, size as our C matrix here. So any typos? Doesn't, doesn't seem to be. So our differential equation, I'm just going to call it capital DE, is going to be equal to our C matrix plus our W matrix. And we're going to have to edit the first and last uh, rows of this to, uh, um, to reflect the boundary conditions. So let's do that right now, actually. So DE, our first row, um, is going to be row zero, all columns. And that's going to be equal to... Uh, it's a 1 in the first entry and zeros everywhere else. So how do I want to do this programmatically? Um, let us just do uh, np.zeros t.size. 
actually t dot shape zero. Let me see. Does this work? Why do I keep calling this t? Um, okay, and now we'll set the first element of that equal to one. So uh, d e zero comma zero is equal to one. And for the last boundary condition, the right hand side. Um, let's do minus one comma all columns. We're just going to basically do the same thing, but instead of the first element being one, the last element is going to be equal to one. So let me just uh, put in all my zeros here. And now I will just say DE minus one comma minus one is equal to one. And the equal sign is kind of a useful thing to have. Okay, so now all we need are a vector of knowns. Well, that's easy again because in the uh, interior here, our differential equation is equal to zero, and it's just equal to the boundary conditions at the uh, left and right hand side. So three for the left hand side, zero for the right hand side. So let's create a, ve a vector called knowns, and that is equal to np dot zeros. Uh, that's equal to r, uh, which is our polynomial dot size. Does that run? Yes. And now, uh, since this is already all zeros, we only need to change the first um, element. So knowns zero is equal to three. Are we good? Good. Now we're ready to solve. So let's call our solution f, and that's going to be equal to. We're going to do the. Um, we're going to call the linear algebra cell function. And it's just DE comma knowns. Looks good. Let's actually uh, plot out the results. So let's come down here. PLT dot plot. Uh, our node points, which are R, and our solution F. And let's just make these a solid uh, point. So that looks okay. Let's print the exact solution out, or plot it out, since we already know it is, is equal to this. So let's come down here, and let's do it up here. Let's say x is equal to np dot lin space 0 comma 1. Let's do 100 points. That's 1,000 points. And y is equal to, what's our d solution? It is 3 cosine pi over 2x. So let's see 3 times np dot cos np dot pi divided by 2 times x. Does that run? Looks good. And let's just plot that with a solid black line. So plt dot plot x comma y. Nailed it. Before moving on, let us interpolate to get the solution at all of these intermediate uh, points because these, these uh, circular dots here are only, only solutions at our node points. So let us, let's do, I don't know, let's turn this off. So <clears throat> this is our exact solution. Now remember, um, up here, we did this definition here theta, which is basically this vector here of polynomial coefficients, is just the inverse of our matrix here times the vector of um, our, our solution points, which, which we now know. So we can just calculate this theta directly, just theta is equal to A inverse times F. So let's come down here and do that. Theta is equal to A inverse, remember it's matrix multiplication times F. Um, let's set up a polynomial now. So P for polynomial is equal to NP dot polynomial dot polynomial and our vector of theta. So now let's plot here. Let's go to a PLT dot plot uh, X comma P of X. And let's make it... Um, Let's make it what? Let's make it um, just a small dot. Um, what did I do? I need to do. Uh, not callable. 
Um, this might be a capital. I need to be a capital P. There we go. And now you can see that these two uh, solutions overlap. Let me move this down here. And I'll just make sure these are blue. Perfect. Um, so for this problem here, I've already done the rescaling. I'm just going to introduce a dummy variable, which I called capital X. And this is our differential equation, basically rescaled down to the interval from um, 0 to 1. And I'm going to make this, uh, do this example in a little more of a, a programmatic way where you can choose the number of um, the number of terms in your polynomial expansion. So here that was hard coded. Down here we're going to do it um, <clears throat> so that we can uh, choose it on the fly. And the reason for us to be able to do that uh, hopefully will become obvious. So uh, up above we had a sixth order polynomial. So I'm going to set n equal to 6. And that's going to be the order of our polynomial. So what I'm going to do is create a dummy array of all zeros and then have the last element be set to 1. And just as above, I'm going to um, construct our Legendre polynomials here and find the roots of, of that um, uh, said polynomial. And then I'm going to append a uh, line at the beginning for the zeroth point uh, at x equals to 0 and then a point at the end for x equals 1. So does this run? Seems to run fine. And now we need to create, um, <clears throat> let's see, what I call the A matrix here. And I don't know quite how to do this uh, vectorally, but we could do it with a for loop easily enough, uh, just like this. So we just loop over the, uh, we create a, an empty matrix of zeros, loop over the elements, put in our, our needed values, and then find the inverse. Uh, does that look good? Yes, it does. And um, I really should have chosen an equation that involved the first derivative or the boundary conditions that involved the first derivative uh, because in neither of these examples do we use what I call here this B matrix here that kind of captures, <coughs> captures the behavior of the first derivative so we can just ignore that for this problem and just work on what I call our C matrix here uh, that kind of captures the second derivative. So let's come down here. And so it's same, basically the same as what we did up here for the A matrix, except we now need to kind of uh, deal with those coefficients that get pulled down when doing the differentiation. Otherwise, it's just the exact same thing. Um, I capture this 1 over 4 pi uh, squared thing here from our equation um, in this matrix. I don't know why I did that, but I could do it now or later. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, first coefficients... Oh, when I calculated the second derivative coefficients, they were based basically on the first derivative, so I need to add those in here. So let me do that. Now it should run. And if I keep my variable name straight, it does run. And just as above, we construct our differential equation, which is basically right here in matrix form. Set up our vector of knowns and then just invert to solve the problem. So let's see if that runs. It does, and just as above, let's plot, uh, let's plot it out. So, uh, I'm going to set up the x variable to go from 0 to 2 pi because that's um, what our original differential equation did. So I'm just going to take this solution here and place x by x divided by 2 pi when I plot it so that we're on the domain uh, 0 to 1. So let's do the y values now. y is equal to, and these are our known y values. The, the I'm sorry, these are the exact solution uh, values. In fact, let's just call it y exact. Uh, exact. So there it is, um, scaled down by the 2 pi. Let's just make sure it runs, see if there are typos. Of course there are. There's one issue. Okay, that's good. So let's just plot it now, and we'll make it a black line as, as usual. So plt.plot x comma y exact black line. And now let's plot our solutions here. So let's plot our solutions at our node points, our interpolation points, and we get, huh. Oh, well, the two, first obvious issue is I meant to do this uh, divided by 2 pi here. 2 times np dot pi. Uh, 
Okay, at least the scale is right now, but this does not look very good. Um, let's do the polynomial interpolation and let's just see what this looks like. In fact, let's do it in the same cell. So I'm going to move this up a line. I'm going to come down here um, and do a um, plt.figure. I'm going to replot this. So we should have two plots now. And now we're going to do the same thing we did above. We're going to calculate our theta. And that's going to be equal to uh, what I called u here, our solution vector. Uh, our inverse A inverse times u, our solution vector. So A inverse matrix multiplied by u. I probably should have kept the notation the same and used an F. Uh, let's generate our polynomial here. So polynomial uh, is a function of theta. And now let's do a plt.plot x divided by 2 times np dot pi. And p and our x values are again x divided by 2 times np dot pi. And let's make this a dashed line here. Uh, we'll make it black and we'll make it uh, like that. Huh, not so good. And now you kind of see why I made it such that we could change the order of the polynomial. So let's come back up here. Let's make it an eighth order polynomial. Run, 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 run. This looks pretty good here. A little bit off here, a little bit off here. And this is not too bad. You see it misses here. Um, let's go, I don't know. I don't know how far we could take this before you get polynomial wiggle effects. So let's go to a 10th order. Run, 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 run. Yeah, that nails it actually. I'm kind of surprised it worked. You normally don't want to go as high as a 10th order. You just want to keep it 4th, 5th order kind of at maximum because uh, you tend to get these polynomial wiggle effects, which we've, which we've talked about in the case of uh, uh, polynomial interpolations. But uh, in this case, it works. Uh, in a subsequent video, I'll probably show you a more realistic way to approach this problem or where you have like um, uh, functions that kind of change rapidly or wiggle a lot and um, you can't go to the high enough order polynomial to, uh, to, to get it. As it's kind of a spoiler. It's basically a spline interpolation, kind of the same idea, but using a spline instead of just a single polynomial. So, okay, uh, let's wrap this up now. Okay, so that's about it. Uh, again, I apologize if this video is kind of clunky, uh, just the way the schedules have worked out. Uh, it's been, you know, work on it for an hour here, an hour there, and it's been a couple months in the making. So um, I'm going to clean up the notebook and I will try to document some steps uh, more clearly uh, uh, this time than I normally do, just because the video is probably a bit, uh, a bit on the choppy side presentation-wise. In a uh, future video, I'll kind of talk about these spline interpolations to get better solutions uh, without having to go to ridiculously high order polynomials, which is just as impractical in most cases. We kind of got away with it here with the 10th order, but uh, in general, that type of thing doesn't work very well. So yeah, uh, until next time, see you later.